One of the things about living in domestic violence is that you don't always realize you're living in domestic violence until it gets to this point of no return, as I've called it. I don't even remember why this, why we were angry, why we were fighting, and I was joking around with him, and I, I remember like sitting on him, mm -hmm. and I was like, no, you, you know, you're gonna listen, like just joking around, and I remember he kicked me mm. off, and then kicked me again, mm. and then I remember when I told my mom this story, and she got really upset, and I was like, no, but I, I sat on him, it was my fault, mm. and she was like, no, he shouldn't be kicking you. Right. Whenever I was explaining what happened to somebody else who was judging the situation, mm -hmm. for me to make it okay in my mind, I had to kind of take the blame. Mm. Because once you, once you get to that point where you're like, this is not acceptable, it means you have to get out. Right. But if you're not ready to get out, you have to find a reason why you're still there. Mm. And so I think accepting the blame made it easier for me to stay because it was, yeah, he hit me or he kicked me, but you know, I played a role in it. So maybe next time if I don't play a role in it, it won't happen. So I can still stay, right? Like it's okay for me to stay. Right. I think that's what it was. Mm. I have never really met um, a victim or a survivor that their first, having experienced it the first time, the first thing they want to do is report their partner to the police. As we all know, you know, it's sometimes when you're in the situation, you don't even really realize you're in the situation. Um, or you, as a, as a survivor or a victim, can also make um, in your mind say, well, you know, that person was drinking, or you know what, she really, you know, she really loves me, but maybe she's having a bad day. I mean, there's things that we, as survivors and victims, say to ourselves, right? Just in the matter of living, right? Just surviving the situation that you're in. I knew, I'm sure deep down, that it was all wrong, that I wanted to be a part of him and be with him. Nobody could tell me what to do. Um, I had lost a lot of my friends because I made my life revolve around him. So I was alone and I was, all I had was him. So in times when he would tell me to do stuff or when he would text me, it'd be like the only person who was talking to me. So I'd be super excited. And it's kind of like everything that had happened the day before had just erased. I just kind of overlooked the bad stuff because I loved him so much. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it sounds crazy when I talk to people because I'm like, unless you were in that environment, you just didn't, you don't get it. Right. You just don't get it. And unless you've lived in it, you won't understand it because it, it is not logical. He's broken doors. He's taken doors off. He's, you know, choked me. I mean, there was, but there, there were times when I thought, well, I provoked him. And there were times that I thought, okay, I said this and I know I shouldn't have said that. But I know I didn't deserve it. Now, back then, I probably just viewed it as I made him mad. It was always, I made him mad. We had this um, ritual that we would do. When it would escalate, we would try to leave the house mm -hmm. and wait until he'd calm down and then we'd come back. Mm. And so it began to be, he would hide my keys, take my cell phone, dismantle the vehicle so it wouldn't work. And when I knew it was bad, I'd just be like, okay, girls, meet me in the front, you know, five minutes. Most times we wouldn't even make it to the truck before he'd get to me. Mm. We did make it a couple of times to the truck and left. And then, you know, he'd call me, come on home, baby, I'm sorry, the, the whole, you know, that. Then we'd go home and he would be calm and then we'd get through another night. When we would call the cops, I wouldn't press charges. Mm -hmm. So there was no paper trail, and without a paper trail, it's almost impossible to get a protective order. Right. So I you know, ended up harming my situation by not following through. Well, my dad was into some like illegal businesses, <laughs> um, and then he abused my mom sometimes when like they got mad, like they fought over little things and it just got up and then they both fight and then um, they'd both yell at each other and then he'd hit her or something like that. Mm. But like he'd never hit us or anything like that. Like, and like we never, like we've seen him hit her once, but like usually like I just like get my brothers and sisters and just like, just like stay here, like play your games, like act like you don't hear it and stuff like that. So then 
Um, our moms try to get away from him like multiple times, but she always comes back mm. because like she didn't have money for alcohol or something like that. If you could speak to yourself on the hardest day that you had, what's the one thing you would have liked to tell yourself then? I don't, I don't really know, because I can't really think of my darkest days, because I, I, like, when I was younger, um, we went through a lot of stuff, and I, I just kind of blocked most of it out, like, I really don't remember, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, two years of my life, so I wouldn't really be able to tell you that, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think any of it really, like, changed me from who I was, like, the worst things that's happened to me was like was usually something happening to someone I knew and loved mm. so right. um it, it was a mixture between I, I, I want to be a little vague about it but um <laughs> it's definitely domestic violence and a little bit of sexual abuse um which when you're a kid you can't really understand what's happening to you um and you also have, uh, you're, you're more limited as to getting help because it's not that you can just be like, hey, you know, this person is doing this to me. You know, kids are all over the place. They don't know how to express themselves yet. Um, and not everybody can recognize the signs mm. from the outside. Right, when you're inside of it, it could possibly just feel normal, especially if you're a child. I totally thought it was, no I thought it was normal when I was a kid. We at my house, me, you know, how all the guys and the girls hanging out. <clears throat> um, maybe 10 of us in the house. Seven guys, a couple of girls, this, that, and the other. One of my friends literally um, walked in my room and said, hey man, your girlfriend just called her ex-boyfriend at your house. And all I said to him, is that right? And it was like, it was like clockwork, literally. I had these nice little leather gloves and I put them on nice and sweet in front of everybody. Walked out to in front of the kitchen, in front of everybody and slapped the living shit out of her. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I then just what? walked back in my room, took the gloves off. And then what happened from there? Nothing. Nothing. But, but did she come to you and cry? Did she say something? And this was the bad part, my friend was lying. No way. When did you find out? Did you find out late, way later that he was? No, lying? I was like, nigga, I was just playing with you. And did anybody say anything to you when no. you walked? Nobody said anything Not to a you. Thing. So you you did that, and then you you felt like I could do it again. Absolutely. Did yeah. you feel okay with the moment that you hit her? Yeah. How did you feel? Like a pimp. Like this is what they, I thought that that's the thing you wanted to emulate. I thought that that's that was good. That was you know what guys did. I thought that I thought it was totally within my rights to do something like that. Say ten years later, she ended up stabbing me in the chest. So, with a knife? <laughs> yeah. Stabbing you? Yeah. So the police come in, and they say, you know, who in the fuck did this to you? And I didn't want to turn her in, so you know, I didn't. But that was sort of the nature of your relationship. You guys, in many ways, performed a lot of crimes against each other. Quite the bit. And none of you got had to be accountable for that. No which again perpetuated me thinking this was just the way things go. So what violence did you experience? What, what did you go through? Bueno, mi expareja era alcohólico y yo sufrí mucha violencia y Al principio era de, de que no le gustaba cómo me vestía, yo usaba short, uh, vestidos y él me, no, no sabía que era violencia porque él me decía, um, yo te compré un pantalón y mejor ponte este, esto, te ves mejor. Entonces yo accedía porque decía, agua me quiere, o sea, está siendo detallista conmigo y no, no notaba que estaba cambiando mi manera de, de, de vestir. We know our women are isolated and they're, as a result, depressed. There's their their uh, support system, they left back home. Okay, so who do they go to? Yeah. We want them to know they can come here. Right, right. We don't say, you have to go into a shelter, you have to leave. You have... That may not be her reality. Her reality mm -hmm. may be, she's going to stick with this partner mm -hmm. as much as she can, but she just doesn't want to be abused or be hurt. 
or her children. So we're going to work where she's at. Like the shelter system isn't always uh, the best for our community because again, language, documentation status, mm -hmm. she'll probably the, be the last one to be seen at the shelter. So they mm -hmm. can become even more isolated and now she's in another borough. Yeah. And so she ends up coming back within a week. Foreign born Latinas are reporting that they have fear of calling the police um, because of fear of the immigration enforcement climate that's currently um, happening and has been um, pretty intensely over the past few years. But what we're really seeing, which was unique in this study, is that it wasn't just um, foreign born Latinas, it's also native born Latinas that are reporting um, rates of fear of calling the police. Latino youth specifically um, don't call the police unless they fear they feel that the violent situation that's happening between their parents is at the point of life and death. So they already had this sense of we, lack of trust in you know, mainstream services and police um, that they wouldn't call unless they really thought it was to the point that their mother was um, you know, going to be at risk of losing her life. Right. Well, then you add in the layer of this m more recent study um, of immigration enforcement, what's happening now, that they're not even calling then. So early on, we really try to teach them what healthy relationships are, breaking down those myths and stereotypes that come from being, you know, in, even in kindergarten. I remember hearing, and even when I worked at, at, at schools, oh, that person, that little boy or little girl is teasing you because they like you. So if that's what's said early on, and no one's breaking it down, it could translate in an older relationship to be, well, this person's bugging me, or this person's harassing me, but they must be giving me this attention because they care enough about me. So one of the first things we do is we give them examples for healthy, unhealthy, and abusive relationships. And people will ask me, well, how do you, where's the difference between unhealthy and abusive? And it has a lot to do with that repetitive pattern, not saying that if it happens once, it's not abuse. But for example, we'll take asking someone for passwords. So if they ask you the first time, you may be like, well, that was not cool. I don't want to share my password, that's unhealthy. But if it becomes continuous and now they're threatening you, it would cross that line. Now we know that there's this idea, quote unquote, that once you're in a relationship, everything belongs to that person. So you should share passwords if you have nothing to hide. But we introduced the idea of boundaries and boundaries are okay. And if you're uncomfortable and your gut's saying, hey, I don't know about this, but everyone else is doing it, so I'm just gonna move forward. That might be that red flag. Well, the most dangerous men in the world strangle women. When a man puts his hand around a woman's neck, he's just raised his hand and said, I'm a killer. And he may not be trying to kill her with that particular assault when he grabs her around the neck but I guarantee you that he wants her to know that he can kill her. Because once she knows that he can kill her any time he wants, she will live with that for the rest of her life. And the vast majority of violence and abuse that we deal with and that we have been dealing with for years didn't really present this issue until we started digging a little deeper. And then we heard this word choking. He choked me, he choked me. And so we started analyzing case after case after case. And it didn't take us long to figure out, one, we were failing victims of domestic violence all over America that were being choked. And that two, it wasn't really choking, it was strangulation. And strangulation is an incredibly serious crime. When we started, we thought strangulation was like a slap. Today, we realize strangulation is the edge of a homicide. And when you put your hand around a woman's neck, you are seconds away from killing her. Uh, the research has now confirmed this. If a man puts his hand around a woman's neck once in an intimate relationship, he's 800% more likely to later kill her in that relationship. And he may not actually end up choking her or strangling her to death. He may end up shooting her later in the relationship. But this was the marker that told us he was a killer. My stepfather was very, very abusive towards my, my mother. I know that 
many times he would choke her into unconsciousness or until she couldn't get up. She may not have been unconscious, but she literally was incapable of standing up because he had choked her till she was nearly unconscious. And then you, you would see that as a, as a child, you saw that? Yes. Did you ever speak to your mother about that when you were No, child? not when we were children. Mm. Mm. And did she stay married to him? Actually, she divorced him, but that was because um, the child sexual abuse came out. Mm. So she had more motivation other than just herself. Then she had to protect me also. Once I kind of suspected he was cheating, it was kind of like, look, this is already kind of bad. Let's just get out of it. Um, and then he was like, no, you know, give me another chance. And then I was like, you know, it's been bad for a while. Like, let's just end it. The reason he hadn't moved out is because we were on a lease together. And so we were in that point of, you know, you're moving out, I'm staying here. Um, so that's why he was there. Mm -hmm. And it turned into, you know, take me back. And I was like, no. Um, and so he went into our bathroom and... My roommate and I heard like loud noises. Mm. And so we're like, what, what is that? And so I go into the bathroom and he was in there punching the wall. No. And this is something that he did before when he was angry, but never at me, just that's what he did. Mm. Um, so when I saw that, I was just like, okay, why are you so upset? And he just kind of like stared at me and he didn't say anything. And his fists were just like closed by his side. And so I was like, all right. I'm going to walk away. Like, this is kind of weird. And when I turned to walk away, he punched me and then, like, shoved me into our bathtub. And then I tried to get up, and then he was hitting me again, and he just kept hitting. And then he was screaming things at me. He was, like, calling me a name. He was um, saying, like, why don't you care? You know, you don't care about me. It's just going on and on. And in my mind, I'm like, I got to get out of here. And so I'm screaming for help. And then finally... Um, my roommate comes and she's like banging on the door. And so this is when he um, opens the door and they actually end up getting into a fight. Wow. Yeah. I ended up calling the police. Okay. Because um, he refused to leave. Mm. And then the police came and he was arrested. She asked me, so did you cheat on me? I looked her dead in the eye and told her, yeah. And I told her, what you gonna do about it? And I was laying on the ground and she hit me as hard as anybody's ever hit me in my life in the face. Right in the face. Yeah, and she tried to get out the door, and I couldn't let her. That happened, but she knew what she had done. Like, she laid one on me. <laughs> and then did you hit her back because she hit you in the face? Yeah. yeah. What's the worst abuse you've ever committed against a woman? I tried to stop somebody from screaming at the top of their lungs by stuffing a sock down her throat. Oh, my goodness. And did you feel bad about that? No. Why didn't you feel bad about that? She was screaming at the top of her lungs. Why was she screaming at the top of her lungs? I don't know. I she was mean, mad we, at you. We, we, were, we, were, we were getting into it, and she felt like this was the way to call, bring attention. Wow. Uh, so at what moment did you realize that it, that wasn't necessarily love, that there was something that you wanted different to happen? Because it was all justified. He didn't let me out. He me, I'll bring you what you need. You don't need to go out. Entonces cuando yo salí sin su permiso, eh, él se dio cuenta, entonces él me dijo que yo había estado con un amante, que cuando él llegó a la casa y no me encontró, me fue a buscar y me dijo en la calle que yo era una cualquiera, que porque me había salido, de seguro yo había ido a ver a verme con un amante que estaba engañándolo a él. At the time did you have children? No. No, todavía. En el 98 fue que me embaracé okay. y la violencia fue más, más cada vez más, hasta que llegó a golpearme. Me golpeaba cuando estaba embarazada. Se apoderó tanto de mí que yo le tenía, yo jamás en mi vida había sentido miedo, lo que era tener pánico, horror. Yo le tenía horror. Todavía tengo muchas secuelas de eso de que um, él trabajaba en la cocina y cuando él iba a venir yo ol olía su aroma yo sabía que él ya venía bueno yo en, en el tiempo que estuve con él, él él intentó secuestrar a mi hija cuando tenía un mes de nacida uh -huh. y, y yo llamé a la policía okay. pero sufrí um, 
discriminación por, por ser indocumentada, burlas. Uh -huh. Cuando el, los paramédicos, la ambulancia vino porque él me había golpeado. Uh -huh. Cuando me miraron, ellos estaban riéndose y me dijeron que si mi esposo era boxeador, porque me había dejado muy mala cara, burlándose. Y en un, en un momento en que tú estás tan vulnerable uh -huh. y esas cosas en lugar de ayudarte, pues te hunden más. Es más obvio para mí que The, the, the police system in this country is failing people of color, right? So the traditional systems that have been set up of like, okay, the solution to domestic violence is to call the police and to send someone to jail in many communities of color, frankly, we don't want that because, you know, sometimes that seems to be worse than the violence itself at home. It's, it's, it's an impossible choice to make, right? Man, she really hit me in the head with a stiletto one night with like just out of just emotion like crack me. I had like three stitches. When you come from a community of poverty and, 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 and poverty already creates negativity again, they say the number one cause of divorce is finance, the lack of finance. So you already in poverty, you, your finances are minimal. You're gonna be going at it all night when the lights are shut off. Or 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 you're gonna be going through it all night if you don't understand he or she had abusive parents, not just mentally to them, but physically. You 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 have to, you know, talk about these things. Yeah, so the divorce was really, really long, like grueling process. So During that time, I would visit my dad on Thursdays and then the first, third, and fifth weekends. And um, my mom wasn't there anymore. And so the sexual abuse started happening. And um, probably one of the last nights I talked to my dad was um, he got really, really drunk and went and lay in my bed and wouldn't get out. And I was like, okay, dude, like I'm trying to go to sleep, you know. I emailed my mom's lawyer and was like, I don't want to talk about it, but I don't want to ever see my dad again. I don't want to talk to him, I don't want anything. So then I sent him an email explaining basically, basically how I put it is breaking up with my abuser. He had this joke, like dry humping me was a joke. And he would like laugh at it and do it in front of my mom and laugh about it. And so that had happened for the longest time which then I finally started putting the piece together, like, that's not right, like, that's not supposed to happen, you know? And so I finally was like, oh crap, like, that's not okay. Having grown up in a home where there's domestic violence, having been assaulted as a child, either physically or sexually, um, these are risk factors for people when they grow up to either perpetrate or become a victim themselves. However, I do want to say, and this is important to understand, that although there are risk factors, any adult still has a choice. For example, young men who may say, you know, my mother went through this and my father was abusive, I'm choosing not to do that. And others are choosing to continue to do it and may use it as an excuse. Well, I saw my father do that, so I'm just going to do the same. I could say the same thing for, for victims. Well, my mother grew up with this, so I didn't know any better. And while we're never going to blame a victim for what she or he has been through, there's at some point a choice because we see a lot of victims who are victimized, re-victimized, re-victimized, say in domestic violence. At one time, at some point, they say, that's it, I'm done. There was one incident where she started swearing at me and hitting me. I put my arms up like this so the blows wouldn't hit me. I knew that if I grabbed her, pushed her away, if she had any marks or bruises from my doing anything defensive, she could call the police, I could be arrested and not see my children again. My wife blocked our egress to the front door when I picked up our son. Mm -hmm. So I ran with him out into the backyard and I got to the back gate and there was a combination padlock. This falls to the ground so I run out into the alley carrying my son and my wife comes along, she picks up this heavy steel padlock and hurls it at us. Mm. Now, if it had hit our son, it could have injured him badly. Fortunately, she missed. Does the violence look different when the, the woman or the girl is the perpetrator of the violence versus when the male is the perpetrator of the violence? It may not look different, uh, but it may be perceived differently by the victim or by the victim's 
um, community of support, so friends, family, whatever. So, um, for example, if a young man would push a young his girlfriend into the lockers, people would see that as a violent act. But if the woman, the young woman, pushes her boyfriend into the lockers, people just say, "Oh, they blow it off." Right? It's 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 felt differently. People, society, we see it differently. Um, oftentimes, when you talk to young men who have been victims of of dating violence, they'll say, "Well, you know, people would just say, well, you know, like, why do you put up with it?' Or, oh, she's not really doing that. That's just the way she is. Or she just causes drama." Whereas a society, if a young woman was experiencing those things, we would be much more apt to say, "Oh, yeah, that's not okay." So um, the the. Oftentimes, the, the incident itself is very similar, but how it's perceived by the victim themselves and by their support networks is very different. Well, before I came into foster care, um, I was actually like, really harsh on myself. Like, I was name called a lot, and so I didn't feel the greatness about myself. And once I came into foster care, then I just started like gaining um, self-confidence and stuff. And since I came here, it's getting, like, gaining more. Gaining more? <laughs> yeah. I felt a lot of shame when things happened. And so, um, I just wanted to hear, like, it's not your fault, you actually, and you, like, mean something and stuff, yeah. At school and stuff, sometimes I feel like I'm the only one that really went through hard times like that and stuff, but now that I come here and I know that other people have the history, then I don't really feel like I'm the only one out here. I just feel like I don't really have to worry about anything, like, this is my time to have fun instead of, like, always worrying about other things happening. Mm -hmm. Last summer, the second week of camp, I was asked by Casey Gwynn to come back for the other three and speak um, about my story to the kids each week. Just kind of help make my story real for me and then uh, being able to put it out there and like use it to help other kids, and turn it into something more positive than negative has uh, really helped me deal with everything and cope with it. Honestly, I think as a whole, rafting is probably one of the biggest, most impactful things just because it's really out of most kids' comfort zones. It's something that they haven't done, and so they're facing their fears, but they're also facing them with a group of their peers that they had met either earlier that week or maybe known from past years. But it really makes them bond on the river because you can't really get the raft where you need to go by yourself. And so they really realize that they, there are other people that are there relying on them and having them rely on them. who called me and he had just come back from Iraq and he was he, he realized he was the abusive partner and he you know he was kind of embarrassed at first like I don't know if he knew how to talk to him he was just like hey I'm kind of gonna be vulnerable here I mean he didn't say it like that but he was he was saying I'm, I'm coming kind of out here and I'm risking this and he starts talking and he says you know I, I do things that I didn't do uh, until I came back I'm not proud of it I don't like who I am, and um, I kind of want to change, but I just don't know how. And at the end of the call, I remember he was just talking. We talked for about 30 minutes, and he says, uh, you know, I wish I would have met you a long time ago at like an IHOP somewhere. I wish you would have been my friend. I just wish I would have had someone that would have talked to me, and maybe I wouldn't be here. There's help out there, but it's, it's, a, it's a process in just being comfortable with the fact that you did everything you could, and mm -hmm. it's kind of up to them. And you just got to take the next one and kind of pull yourself together and take the next call. Thank you.